Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, after having covered several parallel patterns in previous lectures, we are going to discuss an interesting feature, feature of um, GPU programming frameworks, dynamic parallelism. So dynamic program parallelism provides an interface to express dynamic refinement algorithms in a more natural way. And this dynamic parallelism interface allows GPU threads to launch GPU kernels when new work is dynamically discovered. Uh, you might remember the example of BFS that we covered in one of the uh, parallel patterns lectures where each node in the frontier has a different number of neighbors. And due to that, we will need different number of iterations for each of the nodes in the frontiers. We found or we explained different ways of uh, dealing with this um, irregularity in the parallelization, but this could also be solved probably um, in a, uh, programming in an easier way by using cool dy dynamic parallelism. However, as we will see, it has also some performance implications that we have to take into account. Dynamic parallelism, as I mentioned, allows GPU threads to launch kernels from within GPU threads. That's what we call um, device-side kernel launches, and it appeared with the Kepler architecture. Until then, it was only possible to launch kernels from the host processor. Uh, since then, it's also possible to launch kernels from the GPU itself. And typical use cases for the dynamic parallelism interface are workloads with dynamic load balancing or workloads that um, have data-dependent execution or those that require recursion for the implementation, and they are also useful for library calls. But the biggest advantage is that uh, dynamic parallelism is good for programmability and maintainability. Remember how we launch a kernel or we launch kernels without dynamic parallelism. We always, we always need to involve the host processor to perform uh, the kernel launches. And this is uh, relatively painful to program. Um, with dynamic parallelism, it's possible to launch new kernels from within the GPU as soon as, as soon as some new work is discovered. So we would only need to launch one kernel in the beginning from the host, and then after that, the threads running in the device will be able to launch their child kernels to uh, deal with the dynamically discovered uh, work and uh, parallelize the execution of that work. Uh, one important consideration when launching child kernels from a parent kernel is uh, the, the, the synchronization and the need for memory consistency. There are uh, two things to take into account here. The first one is that from the parent to the child, memory consistency is guaranteed. And that means that when the child kernel starts running, all data that needs to be written to the global memory from the parent kernel will be already in uh, global memory, that's guaranteed. However, in the opposite direction from the child to the parent, we will need to use CUDA device synchronize in order to make sure that the, um, after that point, the kernel will continue the execution once the child kernels have finished. In order to see how to use CUDA dynamic parallelism, let's start with a simple example. First of all, some uh, kernel code, this is a synthetic kernel, that um, needs to do certain amount of work per thread uh, in this uh, for loop that uh, we see here from lines seven to nine. And, um, and this is basically an implementation without dynamic parallelism. As long as this start and end are the same for all threads, the number of iterations will be the same. So the total amount of work performed by each thread will be the same. So in this case, there are no issues with uh, load balancing. However, it might turn out that these start and end values are different for each thread. And in that case, we will have different number of iterations for each thread. And that causes load imbalance and in the end, hampers the performance. With dynamic parallelism, in this case, what we would do is launching a child kernel per parent thread, and the number of threads in this child kernel is going to be the same as the number of iterations in the for loop of the previous slide. And this would be the child uh, uh, kernel performing the uh, same computation that was previously done in the for loop. In this case, the number of iterations per GPU thread of the parent kernel is the same, but now these iterations have been assigned to child threads. And uh, even though uh, we may have different amount of work per 
parent uh, threat, in the end, the amount of war per, per child threat will be the same. And this way, we obtain a better load balance across uh, CUDA threats. Um, as, I, as we mentioned earlier, uh, dynamic parallelism is also useful to implement recursive programs. And today, we are going to see one example, the quad tree. Quad tree is a useful technique to partition the data in a non-uniform uh, space and in order to you know, cluster uh, coins uh, in, a, in a way that they are uh, later uh, more uh, better uh, place for coalescing and for further computation. So in this quad tree, we are going to partition a 2D space by recursively dividing it into four quadrants until the number of atoms or these points that you can see on the slide in each quadrant is less than a threshold. We are going to consider that the threshold is equal to, this is a recursive example, we are going to create a quad tree uh, to cluster all these points in the corresponding quadrants uh, in the beginning in depth zero of the tree, what we have is the entire 2D space with all the atoms, with all the points. When we go to the next level, to the next depth, we would have already partitioned the entire 2D space into four quadrants. And in this case, um, we have already clustered some uh, of the atoms. Some of these quadrants, like these, one, these two here, will not uh, proceed further in the partitioning because, as you can see, the number of atoms is two, which is exactly the same as our threshold. In depth uh, two, we'll continue doing the same for those uh, two uh, quadrants that had more than two atoms, and we partition them further. And finally, in depth three, uh, it's only this little quadrant here that um, is still being processed because it originally had more than two atoms. How to implement these on a GPU? The first thing that we are going to do is launching one simple, well, it's uh, not that simple indeed, but it's simple in the sense that it only has one thread block that is launched from the host. And we assign the entire 2D space to that thread block. That then what the threads in this thread block are going to do is to identify what are the points that are in the different quadrants in order to do the further partitioning. So after assigning the block to a node, and this node is the root node in depth zero that um, encompasses the entire, the entire 2D space, first thing to check is the threshold and also if uh, we have reached the maximum depth of our algorithm or not. And next, in this case, we continue the execution here, we compute the center of the bonding box. The bonding box is a, is a, is a box that contains all the points and the center of that bonding bonding box is going to be the point that tells us where to partition, where the four quadrants are going to be, and based on that, uh, find what's the number of points in each quadrant, because those points are going to be later processed by the children of this thread block that is uh, running the algorithm. Now that we know the, the number of points in each quadrant, the number of points for each children, we can perform a scan operation in order to find the offsets where the um, different points in each quadrant need to be written in the output array. And next, we are going to place them in the right place, reorder the points. So we have two buffers. One is the input buffer, where we have uh, all the points in their original posi positions. And then we have an output buffer that will have the uh, order points. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in this uh, output buffer, uh, we will have precise limits for the points that are contained in each quadrant. So this is the, uh, this is the um, top left quadrant, this is the top right quadrant, this is the bottom left quadrant, and this is the bottom right quadrant. In the next uh, uh, level, in depth one, the thread block zero has launched the four children, and now each of the four children repeats exactly the same algorithm for the uh, specific uh, quadrant that they have. Two of them will uh, retire early, uh, this block 00 and block 01 that have been, or uh, actually it's block 00 and block 02 that have been assigned these two quadrants with only two points, because remember the threshold is two. The other two, 01 and 03, will proceed further and they will launch their own children to process the uh, sub quadrants of their uh, quadrant. And in the end, uh, we will have one. A single uh, thread block of this that is launching uh, its uh, own 
uh, uh, children, its own uh, children thread blocks to go over these um, small quadrants here. And that will give us the um, exact output with the uh, different atoms in the 2D space clustered uh, according to the specific quadrants they belong to. So in summary, the execution starts with the host launching one thread block and at each recursion, uh, if the number of atoms in the quadrant is less than or equal to the threshold, the thread block exits. Uh, if not, in each recursion, the threads in each thread block that do not exit, first determine what's the number of atoms that belong to each quadrant. They need to find the center of the bonding box. Remember that uh, to identify the points in each quadrant. And then the performance can to determine the starting point of each quadrant in the output buffer. Next, they reorder the atoms so that all atoms in the same quadrant are placed consecutively in the output the buffer. And finally, one representative thread, typically thread zero of the thread block, will launch a kernel with four or child blocks. So this is how uh, we would implement the quad tree construction using dynamic parallelism. And these can also be applied to other data structures, for example, oak trees that could be for a 3D uh, space. But there are some performance limitations, uh, even though dynamic parallelism ensures better work balance and offers advantages for sure in terms of programmability and maintainability, as we mentioned. However, um, there are um, um, certain challenges that we may face when uh, implementing our codes with dynamic parallelism, because if we launch grids with a very small number of threads, that this might lead to underutilization of the GPU resources. So the general recommendation is to launch child grids with uh, a large number of thread blocks, as many as we can in order to occupy as many of the GPUs, uh, GPU resources, GPU cores as possible, or at least if the child grids don't have many thread blocks, at least, at least make sure that these thread blocks have hundreds of threads um, if the number of blocks is uh, small. Regarding nested uh, parallelism that we can implement with dynamic parallelism uh, with uh, recursion, um, the one limitation here is that the maximum nesting depth is limited by the hardware, so only relatively shallow trees can be implemented efficiently. And then for each of the nodes of the tree in the recursion, um, it will be uh, preferable to use uh, thick tree nodes. Those are nodes that deploy many threads or at least that the branch de degree is large so that each parent node has many children. So these two are in line with the general recommendation uh, that we have uh, in this slide. So one optimization for uh, dynamic parallelism. There are different optimizations that we can apply. We are going to very briefly introduce one optimization that allows us to reduce the kernel launch overhead and increase the utilization of GPU resources because we are going to make sure that we will have wider child kernels, larger child kernels with more thread blocks and with more threads in total uh, to, better, uh, to make better, better use of the GPU resources. And also uh, remove part of the um, launch overhead because every single kernel launch entails a certain amount of overhead that, are, that is in the critical path. If we are uh, uh, what uh, indeed this uh, optimization consists of, which is aggregating uh, all the different kernel launches in a single one so that we don't have so many kernel launches, we will be able to see some performance improvement for sure. So observe that in the original kernel, we will have uh, different threads or many threads launching their own child kernels. We can apply different aggregation techniques, for example, at warp granularity or block granularity or even kernel granularity um, in order to reduce the number of threads that are launching. For example, in the warp granularity is just one kernel launch launch per warp, and this is something that we can easily achieve by communicating um, uh, between threads of the same warp. Each of these are is first going to decide how many child thread blocks need, uh, for, 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 uh, how many threads per thread block, and this information is passed to a single leader thread of the warp that will um, launch a larger kernel with uh, as many thread, thread, child thread blocks that are as, as, as are needed by the uh, other threads in the warp. And 
uh, we can do that at the work granularity, block granularity, or maybe uh, simply have a single kernel launch from the uh, host processor. But if you want to um, learn all the details about this technique, uh, please take a look at this paper that you can find here, or also watch the longer version of this lecture. You can also find many more about CUDA dynamic parallelism in chapter 21 of the Programming uh, Massively Parallel Processors book. This is all for today. Thank you very much for your attention.